Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good? Well, life's a roller coaster, right? So whether you're up on a hill right now and everything's really great, or you're down in the valley right now and things are a little tough with something you've got going on, always remember there's power in God's name. Message today is about love. We can stand in God's love, right? All right, let's sing about that. One. tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I bring. when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken, my fear. longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the night. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be every chain There's power that can empty out a grave There's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name Power in your name There's power that can break off every chain When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Good morning, church. Good morning. Sorry about the slight delay in the start. Um, every once in a while, I just forget what I'm supposed to do with my phone, which is plug it in and turn on Facebook Live. <laughs> um, I put my notes on that. That's how much I forgot this morning. Um, anyways, so a couple of really important things this morning and announcements. First, our membership class is starting February 1st. I believe it's the Wednesday. We're going to run through the whole month. It'll be at 6.30. We're going to start here the first Wednesday, and then we'll determine where we're going to go after that. So it'll be four weeks. Um, if you have any questions, let Ivan and Amy know. Um, the second thing is 
We have discussed um, over the course of the year multiple times about putting our some of our savings into a higher yield savings account. I was given um, an option, and unfortunately, they don't do business accounts. So Ivan was not agreeable to put it in his name and throw it in there. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> so I had to kind of look outside of that. Our, ba our current bank, though, Associated Bank, has a new money market that would be 3%. So I'm waiting to hear back from the gentleman there. So not quite what we had talked about, but still 3% is better than zero or small. Um, so that is a plan. The elders uh, agreed that we would move forward with that. So that's something we're kind of talking about today. We're not doing anything with that chunk that we're putting in savings. However, um, Ivan and I have had multiple meetings um, with a finance advisor and then um, BGW, which is Building God's Way. It's an architecture firm that works kind of in the Trinity where they, in the Trinity thought. So they have architect, builder, owner all together instead of separate. Um, and so a lot of that communication was brought to the elders, and they have talked about moving forward, bringing it to the congregation. So I'm going to let Ivan come and talk about what that looks like. Um, but before we do, I just want to pray, um, because I want everybody to be in the right frame of mind. So let's pray. Father God, you are a big, big God. And you have taken this church many places over the course of its existence serving you. We've been in a school, we've done a Saturday service, we've done an overflow, we've tried a lot of things, God. And now we've been kind of still for quite a while. And so God, as we walk into these next phases, I pray that you give us guidance and clarity of our next steps. Help us to dream big like you are big. Help us to see what comes next and how we can serve you through all the phases of it. God, I lift you up right now, and I pray that you give us all peace about decisions as we move forward with your church, and not just this building, but the people in it, God. We thank you so much for your divine intervention in our lives and how you move us and help us to grow closer to you. And we pray through this process that we can seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. glass doors into a big foyer where hundreds of people are gathered together lifting up the name of Jesus. Of a place where people who are broken can come and be healed. Of a place where families can come and experience restoration and joy. A place where a community can gather together and experience peace and happiness. Where people are coming to Christ left and right. That dream starts here and starts with us. But it's fulfilled at a different location, a different place. A few miles from here, we have six acres of land. And that dream didn't begin with me, but it began with the purchase of that land when Randy and the others had a, had a vision of what God could do here in, south, in southern Wisconsin. That land, we want to build a building. That project begins here, and it ends there. But in order to get there, we need to remodel re and renovate. So we're asking you to consider hiring uh, Building God's Way, an organization that has helped thousands of churches and hundreds of Christian schools fulfill these types of dreams. The process to have them come and, and uh, assist us with the architectural designs, whatnot. Uh, it's 18000 And we have 10 of that in the building fund, and the rest uh, we have uh, within the uh, savings from the sale of the building and the 16000 that we received from, uh, was it TSC? 13. Thir I think somebody had put it well when they said, we're burying that in the ground right now. We want to take it out and invest it into God's kingdom and see this dream fulfilled. So we're asking you guys to dream a little dream with us.
The word charrette is a, is a term that we learn as architects that implies getting the right people around the table to make decisions in an expedient way. We entered into the charrette design phase. Um, three days spent intensively together, kind of throwing out, casting that vision. And um, by the end of that three days, we had a product that we could believe had been formulated in that sort of a country. Oftentimes, I'll get before a group and the staff has a really good idea of vision and purpose, but the transference to the, to the larger group hasn't been made completely yet. And so that first discussion is usually guiding people through intergenerationally how we get to a common vision. Building God's Way listened exactly to what we wanted and what we had to say. So that made us feel really good that we were off on the right foot when we saw the early conceptual designs and they incorporated everything that we had shared with them that was important to us. It was very clear that they understood our goals, they understood our desires, um, our needs, and, and they just worked to that end. They knew what we wanted to do as a ministry. They knew what we valued. They knew what was what is important to us. Um, and I'd say that was probably the, the biggest thing for me as, as a pastor of this church, of knowing that the people that I'm working with that kind of catch the vision that we have for our church. It felt like they were serving us, not just doing us a service. But they said at the end of three days, we'll have a rendering. And it won't be final, but it'll be a rendering. And I thought, there's no way. Now we've worked. This is our third building that we've built since I started here. Uh, we worked with other architects. And there was, I always felt like they were saying, this is what we do. Uh, whereas BGW, that, with the shrimp process, they come in, and at the end of three days, like they say, they have a rendering. And I remember when they unveiled it, I was like, oh, that's who we are. We know the vision, but to be able to speak to the vision and articulate the vision um, to yourself, to your team, to the architects, to bring that alive, it's been an awesome experience. I was down. Additionally, whoa, sorry. Additionally, um, in that process is not only renovation plans here, but the new building plans. Those may change when we get closer to the time of building, but this is a phase one of many. Um, when we looked at cost of that building there, we just don't have that yet. And so this is the beginning of that. Um, so this kind of serves as the first of two weeks discussion. Obviously, after, if you have questions, um, we're available to talk about that. And offering time, conveniently. <laughs> Don't worry, we're only going to pass the bags once. <laughs> well, it's good to see everyone here today. And... Uh, whether you're a member or whether you're a non-member, but you've been just coming here and enjoying the fellowship here, um, it's an exciting time um, to be part of uh, New Life Bible Church. And 
Um, again, this goal has got nothing to do with the leadership. It's got nothing to do with the pastors. It's got nothing to do with um, anything. But the only thing it's got to do with is the kingdom, uh, building God's kingdom. And if we keep that laser focused on building God's kingdom, then miracles will happen. And um, that's what we're here to do. And we've been talking about this for a long time, and um, but we feel that it's time to stop talking and get into action and and uh, letting God do miracles around us. So it's an exciting time. So be praying about that. Um, we need everybody in on it, and uh, just be praying that um, God's going to work miracles, and we're excited to see what God's going to do. So, Marty, can I have you come up here and help me, please? Sorry, brother. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for this awesome day you've given us, Lord, another day just to draw breath and um, love on you and worship you and praise you, Lord. And we thank you for um, what's ahead of New Life Bible Church. We we just um, we're excited about what you have for us, Lord. We're excited to see your miracles. We're excited to see you work ahead of us, Lord, and uh, just help us to remain focused on you and nothing else. And uh, we thank you for everyone here today. We thank you for this church that you've assembled called New Life Bible Church, that we can be missionaries and we can be a light on a shining hill, Lord. Um, and um, we just ask for your guidance and direction. And as we take this offering, Lord, as we've learned that we have nothing, Everything we have belongs to you. Every single penny we've got belongs to you. Now it's an opportunity that we can give back to you and look forward to um, you working with it. And we pray it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. When I was in high school, there was a black and white comic strip in the paper that said love is dot 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 and then the bottom line would change and the picture would change i look i googled some just to refresh my memory of these comic strips um it, i had to scroll through a whole bunch to find any that really were actually what love is they would say things like love is two hearts traveling the same path and they're cute right um, when a guy liked a girl, often they would get some scissors and cut out the comic strip and leave it on their desk. And the girl would be like, oh, you know, <laughs> he's just the best, you know. So actually, that's not really, most of us did not talk about what love really is. But the scriptures give us a chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that really describes what love is. And I would say this is one of the most convicting uh, chapters in the Bible. And we're focusing on the fruit of the Spirit in the next few weeks, and today we're talking about love. So I'm going to read this to you. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And I, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hope all, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I'm going to stop there. Ivan and I are picking out paint colors for the house. That sounds fun, except he doesn't always let me pick what I want exclusively. 
he insists on liking it too. I don't know. <laughs> we're actually having a great time and we're finding colors we agree on and that's exciting when you can come to that point. I'm picking on him a little bit here. But I've been thinking a lot about, because Ivan comes home from these meetings and just tells me that we're going to be praying about moving forward with this building. Nobody wants to do a building project. That's not fun. That's, t that's hard, right, John? That's hard. But maybe necessary. And so this is something that the Lord, I feel over the last several months, has been convicting me of. Because when you go to a new church, I got to start fresh. You know, you don't know, you didn't know me. So I get to start again. And Lord, what, what, what kind of pastor's wife do I want to be here? What kind of friend do I want to be here? It's nice having a fresh start. Um, so I'm going to go back to verse 4. If the Lord calls us to build this building or to re renovate this one, whatever he calls us to do, if each of us can say, can think about this before we vote, before we make decisions, before we get angry, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. And that's what the Lord, that, that last one is what the Lord's been convicting me of. Everybody has different tastes. Everybody has different opinions. But we are united here with one purpose, and it's to glorify our Lord, regardless of the color of the carpet and the paint on the walls. So less things have divided a church. Smaller things have divided a church. We're not going to let this, this opportunity to reach our community by feeling, we're not full today, but sometimes we're full in here. And at one time, a visiting family came, and there wasn't enough seats. So we got to get a little bigger. We got to do something so that we're ready. Because if they come in and there's no place to sit, they're not coming back. If this church is 80% full, people don't come back. They don't want someone they don't know sitting right next to them. I don't even like going to movies if I have to sit next to somebody that I don't know, you know? <laughs> so... And this is just something the Lord's been laying on my heart. And let's pray together right now. Of course, this needs to be thought about in our own lives, in our own marriages, the way we raise our children. As a homeschool mom, this is still very convicting to me in that sense, too. Love is patient and kind, Mom, when we're doing school. Let's ask him to help us. That We are such a joy and a light to the people that are doing the construction, to everyone we meet in the community that they know something is different over there, and it's Jesus at New Life Bible Church. Father, you wouldn't ask us to do it if we couldn't. Just ask for your help, Lord. Help us to be patient. Help us to be kind. Help us not to envy or boast or not be arrogant or rude and not to insist on our own way. Help us not to be irritable or resentful in every relationship of our lives, Lord. Help us to be able to take a breath to think of you, think of what we're saying, think of what we're doing and how what we're saying and doing affects someone else, Lord. I pray for unity. One of the beauties of this church is the unity here, the love for each other, and I am so excited that I get to be a part of it. I'm just asking you that you will keep us this way, that you will keep us united, and that we'll remember the end goal is to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
we thank you that we can come as we are. We don't have to be good before we come to you, Lord. Because if that were the case, none of us would be able to come to you. We can come to you today because of what Jesus has done for us. We're here to worship you, glorify you, honor you. Thank you for everything that you have done for us, God. We thank you for your love, which is a perfect example of how we are supposed to love one another, Lord. I pray for the message this morning that Pastor Ivan is going to bring us, Lord. It will touch our hearts, our souls, our spirits in ways that will change us throughout the days to come. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see what's wrong with black walls. <laughs> it's easier to glorify the Lord <laughs> with black walls, less distractions. <laughs> Pray with me, please. Father, this morning we're uh, we're tackling the first fruit of the spirit and perhaps the hardest one uh, to tackle. Lord, it's such a, love is such a monumental topic that there is no way that I would do it any justice this morning. But Lord, perhaps you can still motivate us. Motivate us to be the type of lovers that you call us to be in our families, in our communities, Lord, sometimes love isn't easy. It's sometimes it's incredibly challenging and requires difficult decisions. But insofar as we are filled with your spirit, we're making those decisions in love. So Lord, challenge us this morning. Help us to see the love that you've shown us and how that love ought to work in our lives. In your name, amen. Um, I have some notes that I'm uh, my goal is to produce them every week, and they're going to get bigger and better and expansive. And it's going to become a whole entire booklet, and you could <laughs> give them to your friends like trading cards. <laughs> this morning we're talking about love. How do you possibly talk about love? Love has so many different facets to it. There's romantic love. There's the love of a parent to a child, the love uh, of a son to a, towards his mom. Love has so many different facets. So it's, it's like a diamond with so many different edges, and every edge is important in order to be able to reflect, uh, properly reflect light and, and cause it to shine. People sing about love. Back when I was younger, the song, What is Love?, Everybody know the rest? There you go. <laughs> Apparently, he's asking, if you're loving me, stop hurting me. <laughs> There's poems and endless volumes of books have been written on it. It's something that we chase after, yet can never quite catch. It's something that when it is lacking from our lives, we are broken. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit, and I believe it is this because of its importance within our lives as followers of Christ. So this morning, I want to share with you how love is revealed in Christ, it's reflected uh, to, towards others, and received in the Spirit. It's, re it's revealed in Christ, reflected towards others, and received through the Spirit. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Galatians this morning. And I'd like to say just a small note on how to study the Bible. There are different ways in which we study the Bible. Sometimes we uh, go through it from Genesis to Revelation in our Bible reading. Other ways, I'm going through it chronologically in my Bible reading, which is really, it gets real choppy, uh, particularly when I get to um, almost in First and Second Samuel. 
and, and there's psalms attached to it. So chronologically, it's pretty choppy. Uh, there's a way in which we can study the Bible according to time periods. So I said, I want to study the period of King David. And so you just look at that time period, and we can study according to authors. And what we're doing this morning and for this series is studying, uh, these, uh, f- studying the fruit of the Spirit according to what Paul says about this particular fruit of the Spirit. So this morning we're staying within the book of Galatians primarily, but as we move forward in the fruit of the Spirit, we'll branch off into other things that Paul has said in order to give us a, a more rounded view of, of one particular author's uh, comments on what that thing is. So what does Paul say about self-control? What does he say about gentleness and faithfulness? So we won't be in the entire New Testament, but we'll, we'll stay localized within one author to see what that particular author has to say uh, on this topic. And these are, these are incredibly rewarding ways to approach the Bible. Uh, there, there are ways that help energize me when I read and I study and I say, well, what does God say about uh, creation? And you, you walk away a little bit in awe of how a theme is worked throughout Scripture. When we get to Exodus, we'll see that the building of the tabernacle reflects uh, creation. So studying the Bible thematically can be very, very rewarding. So this morning we'll be in the book of Galatians, starting in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. And we'll see how love is revealed in Christ. There are two verses. Paul begins in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. Notice that uh, Paul then goes on to say that they have adopted a different gospel. And this other gospel, if it is the opposite or opposed to what Christ, what Paul has preached about Christ, then this other gospel would be devoid of the loving mercy of Christ. But what did, how did Christ display his loving mercy? The second verse on the list and how Christ, how love is revealed in Christ is Galatians 2.20, where he says, I've been crucified uh, with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We see in these two verses that love is a sacrificial self-giving of oneself. How did Christ reveal his love to us? How did God the Father, how does the Spirit reveal his love to us. It's revealed in his sacrificial self-giving of himself to us. There are songs who, that sing about men and women who would swim the ocean to show their love. One guy actually did it. Uh, I, he, he literally swam the ocean. I wonder if he's still alive. <laughs> but we, we typically use this language. We use exaggerated language. I love you. I love you. Today you die. When I was before Christ in my mess, I had friends. Oh, you know, we're with you. We'll ride or die uh, until things got a little tough. Then they were gone. They 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 try to communicate this brotherly love of unity and, and, and solidarity. But when push came to shove, they were nowhere to be found. So how does Christ reveal His love to us? This is what I think is different within what the Bible says versus all other religions. God was never a God who says, come to me. He's always a God that said, I'm going to come to you. All other gods say, come to me, do this for me, uh, serve me. God the Father says, I'm coming to you. And it's a pattern that's consistent throughout the scriptures. God is always coming to us, chasing us, pursuing us. Even in Genesis 11, where God comes down to see what's going on. God personally uh, speaks with Abraham when he and two angels show up for dinner. Moses tells the Lord, I'm not moving unless you come with us. Which is the same attitude we uh, prayerfully want to have as we look to our future. God's not in this. We don't want to go. The Gospel of John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He, he made his home with us. When we think of a home, we think of a place where we reside. 
a place where we feel safe, a place of joy. And uh, perhaps we didn't have homes like this, and so there's an ideal of a home that we have that reflects this. Whether we grew up in a home that was this way or not, we still have this idea that the, uh, of a place called home, which is also a fantastic book that just came out by um, the author's name escapes me at the moment. And we have this idea of a place that's safe and secure, and a place where we can be ourselves. God has come to make his home with us. Revelation tells us when it's all said and done, behold, the home of God is with men. Jesus says, hey, I'm standing here at the door. I'm knocking. If you let me in, I'm going to come and make my home with you. When we think of how love has been revealed to us in Christ, it's revealed by someone who went out of his way to come and make his home with us. This is why the Apostle Paul, when he speaks of their conversion, talks about the loving mercy of Christ. There can be stale, cold mercy, but, but that stale, cold mercy is distant, arm's length. The loving mercy that we were shown was the mercy that came to us, that, that drew near to us, that pursued us. This is the gospel message that, that God sent his son to pursue us, to deliver us, to set us free. This is why in Galatians 2, 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. This life is no longer mine, but it belongs to him. It belongs to the one who loves, loved me and gave himself for me. I think those two phrases in that verse, loved me and gave himself for me, they reflect one reflects the other. So if you were to ask Paul, how did Christ love you? He loved me by giving himself for me. Perhaps you have had people do nice things for you. How did it make you feel when somebody sacrifices time or, or treasure or talent to help you? It makes you feel pretty good. Uh, unless you're a cold-hearted person and you're like, ah, about humbug, whatever. But typically, it, it melts your heart a little bit. And the bigger the sacrifice, the more it melts your heart. So it is with our God. He says that I'm going to take that heart of stone and I'm going to put in the most intense heat that has ever been created. It's called the love of Christ. And I'm going to melt that heart of stone and give you a soft heart towards me. When we think of the love of Christ and we think about love, it ought to generate love within us. I was thinking back to my own personal experience when I came to Christ and how revolutionary it was for me and how transformative it was. And it was so because I know what God has delivered me from. And though it's not, I want to call it a benefit per se, yet there is a vivid reminder for me in my life that I've been delivered from some serious things. But you don't have to you don't have to have been an outlaw to enter into that joy. You don't have to have been the worst person uh, in the world to, to realize what you've been delivered from. The Bible tells us that we all have done things contrary to God's ways. That we have all lived in chaos and disorder. That our lives were marked by a complete rebellion and disobedience. And yet, it was in this state, not when we were buddy-buddy with God, but while we were in rebellion to him, he sent his son to us. And that, uh, that mind frame ought to cause any one of us to jump up and, and dance over what God has done for you. You don't have to do it now. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not going to hold you back. I'm not going to be... Like uh, David's wife would say, oh, look at King David dancing. Oh, no, don't go as far as he did. <laughs> Just saying, if you're familiar with the story, then, you know. But it ought to get any one of us to jump up and dance over what God has done for us. Whether you came to Christ when you were this big and, and you hardly even remember the experience and you've lived a pretty decent life, your whole, you've been delivered from eternity of hell. 
And if your parents came to Christ and you're experienced that you're second generation, that parent knows what they've been delivered from. My father-in-law, great, great man of God, faithful follower, servant for uh, served 40 years in Chicago, has car stolen several times, all, all kinds of disasters befell him. But he knew what he was delivered from. And because of what God did in his life, he wanted to show that to other people. Brothers and sisters, do you know that God had pursued you? Do you know that he sacrificed for you? That he bled not just a drop of blood, but he bled out so that you may live. We need to find new and fresh ways to relive this amazing old story. To enter into the passion of Christ with fresh eyes on a daily basis. To remind ourselves just how much God has revealed love to us in Christ. That this love is sacrificial. That it pursues. That, that it continues to pursue. Do you know now, even now, if you're far from God, he's still pursuing you. If you are hearing these words and, and, and through these words, God's now reaching out to you. And you know it. You know it. Because he's, pursu- he's a pursuer. He's not the type of person who loves from a distance. He is up front and center. And because such great love has been revealed to us in Christ, therefore we reflect this same love in our lives. And I, I'm in touch on the word reflect. And because what we're designed to be is we are images of God. And, and like a mirror reflects the image of the thing that's in front of it, so our lives are designed to reflect the love of Christ so that when Christ stands in front of us, this love is then reflected back to others. And when I speak of Christ standing before us, Jesus says that if you've done this to one of mine, so you've done it for me. Sometimes people say, well, I wish Christ would just show up. I wish he would come down and reveal himself. The word of God tells us that Christ reveals himself in his body so that you are designed to reflect the love of Christ towards others. Galatians 6, 5, 6 says, For when we... We placed our faith in Christ Jesus. There is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. Our faith is in action. It is not passive. It's not theoretical. But faith is action. We went through James a few months ago, and James tells us over and over again that faith works. Faith works both for our lives and faith works in the things that we do. That faith works. And if we say we are in Christ, then our statement ought to be backed up by loving actions. As what Paul says, what's important is faith expressing itself in love. So that same sacrificial love that we see in Christ is thus reflected in our lives towards others. He says this again in Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. When he speaks on freedom, he's talking about freedom that's found in Christ through the Holy Spirit and how he has set us free from the, the uh, identity markers that, that they used to have for themselves and saying, this is how we're in good relation with Christ. This is how we're in good relation with, with God. They had certain identity markers. One of them was the law. So they would say to themselves, of course we're in good relation with God. Look at the things that we do. It wasn't that they would do these things to be in a good relation, but this, just, this is what just good followers of God do. But the problem became that the thing that they do became a means for others to come in as well. Paul says, no, the only thing that matters is faith. The only identity marker that we ought to have is love. Thus, the the love that we receive is is reflected from us 
towards others. He quotes from Leviticus 19.18, and that's, that's that one book in the Old Testament that we kind of gloss over. I, I would assume lawyers would love that book because it, it's a series of laws one after another. And I want to encourage you to not gloss over it uh, as easy as that can be. He goes, what it does for us, it reflects the character of God. And there are things in there that, that it's like, wait a minute, how does that reflect the character of God? And within that world and that culture, it's... It shows its great the graciousness of God to that world. And what in Leviticus 19.18, there's a series of laws in how you conduct yourself towards someone else. And within that chapter, in chapter 19, uh, it talks about not defrauding your neighbor, not taking his goods, not, not stealing from them, not, not uh, you know, don't make, not, not going after the, your neighbor's wife and whatnot. And in these series of ways in which you conduct yourself towards your number, neighbor, you find in 1918, love your neighbor as yourself. As in Leviticus, the context of loving your neighbor is to treat them uh, as you would want to be treated according to God's ways and God's laws. Not just like how I want to be treated, but the way that I want to be treated as a follower of Christ. When Paul says to love your neighbor as yourself, he's, and he'll mention this a little later, it means that you're not jealous against them. It's like you're, you're not bullying them. You're not trying to get your ways all the time. You treat them with kindness, with mercy, with compassion. You're willing to sacrifice even if they're unwilling to. To loving, loving your neighbor as yourself is the way Christ loves us. It has to be reflected out from us towards others. And your neighbor is not just the person who lives next door to you. But your neighbor, in a very general sense, is anyone who's within your sphere of influence. You can have a social media neighbor. as anyone within your friend's network. You have neighbors at school, those who are in the locker next to you or your fellow classmates. Your neighbor sometimes can be your siblings at home, which, can, which may be the most challenging to reflect this type of love, too. But it can also be a good beacon to let us know where we're at. Your neighbor is anyone who's in your sphere of influence. And Paul tells the Galatians that in your conduct towards one another, you already have enough tension within your communities. Why create more tension from within? So then they're to love each other as, as, they're, uh, as themselves. Verse 50 says, but if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. The opposite of love, it, it, it's attacking. It's going after. It's manipulating. It's deceiving. It's twisting. It's trying to get your way, try, trying to uh, bully and bulldoze people. That's not the love that we reflect. That comes out of the flesh. So love is revealed in Christ, reflected in the community, and received through the Spirit. And I'm going to jump back just a little bit because I want us to see the contrast between who I am in myself apart from Christ and who God is making me to be. Verse 19 of Galatians 5, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful thoughts, Idolatry means devoting yourself to something else. And in Paul's day, in times, biblical times when they're writing, they would have other gods and they would have other statues that represent those gods. In our day, we have idols of the heart. And an idol is anything that you devote yourself to. Uh, it, it could be a person. It could be a thing. It could be a car. It, it could be a, a, a pair of sneakers. It's, it's a thing that you're willing to sacrifice for. Now, there are sacrifices that we make for people that we do as followers of Christ and out of our love for other people, but it's about pecking order. What's primary in your motivations? Is Christ the primary motivator for the things that we do, or is that thing the motivator, trying to keep it happy, trying to keep it pleased? We have our idols, our idols of the heart. And they manifest themselves in things. Shopping malls can be an idol. 
Uh, th- anything that we look to for the good life can be an idol if it replaces Christ. If I look at that sweater and I say, that sweater can make me the type of person that I want to be. That's an idol. That job can make me the type of person I want to be. That's an idol. That relationship can make me the type of person I want to be. That, that can be an idol. So I, although the idols that Paul's talking about may be a little different, the, the point is the same in that anything that we look to for our identity, anything that we look to that says, that's what's going to give me the good life, that can be an idol. Idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarrels, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and if your thing was enlisted, and other sins like these. (laughs) You could just see somebody, well, he didn't say this. Well, he covered it all. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces within us love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Left to my own devices, I produce selfishness. I produce jealousy. I produce selfish ambition. I am all about me. When I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm all about you. I'm all about Christ. I'm selfless. I'm not pursuing my identity and and trying to enlarge in my territory, but wanting to reflect the goodness of God in my life. Thus, love is revealed in Christ, reflected in our lives, and received through the Holy Spirit. If you want to love like Jesus, you can't on your own. You need the power of the Spirit in your life to produce love. Love isn't something that we force, although we practice it. Love isn't something that that we have to do, though it it does become habitual. Love is something that the Spirit of God produces in us as we yield ourselves to the Spirit. I want to share with you just two thoughts as we think about love how to produce love in our lives. Uh, And these thoughts come from uh, James K.A. Smith's book, Uh, You Are What You Love. And the the foundational idea to his book is that you will uh, reflect what you love. as As unconscious as it may be, what you love will show up in your life. If you love clothes, that will show up in your life. If if you love a certain sports team, that will show up in your life. Go Packers. (laughs) I genuinely am rooting for them, by the way. FYI, I can love two teams, right? (laughs) One must go. (laughs) Yeah. What I love, if I love cars, it's going to show up in my life. If I love video games, I'm going to talk about them all the time. If I love a person, they're going to be on my mind, on my heart, constantly speaking about them. What you love shows up in your life. And if you're doing a brief inventory of your life right now, let me ask you, what do you love? What pops to the forefront of the things that you love? Stephen uh, James K. Smith talks about all of life is worship because all of life is love. And he gives us encouragements to look out for what he calls secular liturgies, the things of this world that we worship. He gives the, some uh, different examples, but whether it's clothing, whether it's a shopping mall, but it's and the things that, that we worship are the things that we look to for the good life. Some think that a new car, that's the good life right there. So I'm going to pursue that. 
the things that we worship, we worship them because we believe that they can provide for us the good life. Otherwise, we would not commit ourselves to them. And so as you think about what you love, another way of asking that same question is what do you look to to give you the good life? Is it a certain uh, monetary uh, income throughout the year? If I make $150,000, that's the good life. That's an idol. If my spouse would just paint the house the color that I want, <laughs> then that'll give me the good life. Yeah, that can be an idol. <laughs> How if me and so-and-so, if we could just get married, we would be so happy together. That'll give me the good life. That's an idol. Because whatever we look to to provide for us the good life, that's what we're worshiping. Where does God rank in that list? Well, the encouraging thought is that we grow in our love for Christ. If Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac the day he was born, who knows? <laughs> that 17 years after when he's a teenager, he's like, all right, cool. No problem then. <laughs> but his willingness to sacrifice him shows that God was first in his life. But he didn't, he wasn't there overnight, but he was moving in that direction throughout his life. So you may be right now thinking, I don't know if I look to God to provide for me the good life. If he's on the list, he, he can he can't move. And, and as we devote ourselves to him and as we grow, uh, hopefully he starts to go higher and higher in the list. But one thing that helps me bump him up my list, and sometimes he's on top, and sometimes he's third, and sometimes he's sixth, but the goal is to keep him on top. What helps me grow in my realization of his love is through confession. One way is through confession. By confessing my sins, which churches used to have corporate confession uh, as part of, uh, part of their regular worship. But through confession, we're reminded of what we've been delivered from. We're like the young lady who is weeping at Jesus' feet and wiping her tears with her hair. Simon Ferris, he says, if Jesus knew what kind of woman that really was, he wouldn't let her do that. Jesus knew, knew exactly what kind of woman she was. And the woman knew exactly what kind of woman she was and what she had been delivered from. And out of that realization came deep love for Christ. When was the last time you spent some time in morning, evening, afternoon confessing to Christ? And not just, Lord, here's the list of things I did. We're good, we're good right? We're cool. But really allowing the pain of what you've... This is part of our fast week was to allow uh, our bodies to experience physical pain as a reflection of the pain of the sin and chaos that we create. One way in which we can grow in love of Christ is, is through confession. And in confession, we realize what we've been delivered from and can enter into the joy of what Christ has done. This is why we have to be on the lookout for these secular liturgies, as he's called them, the things that in this life that we worship, the things that we look to to provide for us the good life. If Christ is not at the top of the list, we need to get into a regular practice of confessing our sins. And the second thing is that love is a habit, uh, and that may seem stale and unloving, Sometimes people feel that if love is not spontaneous, if it's not, uh, if it's not, uh, un you know, if you're doing it because you have to, it's not love. And that's just not true. Sure, there can be those moments of spontaneity. But you know, God planned to send Jesus to die and to rise again. So in eternity past, the decision was made. I don't know when, where, how, I don't know how that meeting went. But there was nobody in that meeting that said no. 
I had assumed they were fighting over who got to go. Love ought to be planned and ought to be habitual. Uh, back in the day, they, we call these things virtues. But love is a discipline. It is, it is not normal to love this way. It is counterhuman to reflect the love of Christ in our lives. And so if you uh, never ever feel bad, say, I'm not loving like Jesus, it's counterhuman to do so. The only way that we could do that is by making the habit of yielding ourselves to the Spirit of God and allowing the Spirit to grow and develop love within us so that the love of Christ is reflected through us as we receive it through the Spirit. We make opportunities for the Spirit, like fasting, like prayer, like devotion, like time of devotion to the Word, but there are other active things that we can be doing as well. I remember uh, people, uh, some friends of mine, we didn't know exactly who, they would leave treats at our doors uh, and wouldn't tell the horn and say, hey, see what I did? And they did this because they were practicing love. And there are different forms in which we can practice. Sometimes practicing love means practicing not saying that I told you so, even though it feels so good to say it. And I just want them to know that I was right. <laughs> But, but to just, I'm not going to say it, because all I'm doing is reflecting myself when I do so. Even, <laughs> I told you to look like that. <laughs> Sometimes me not saying the, the, the snarky, nasty comment that I want to say is my way of loving. And they'll never know it. They'll never acknowledge it. They'll never say, I'm so glad you didn't. Rub my face in this. No, I never say it. I never acknowledge it. So I just have to have peace in myself to know that, Lord, I'm, you know Jesus. You know that I was right. And they should know it, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Sometimes love is sacrificing. Sacrifice can be uncomfortable. And doing what that person, you know, what you know they need done, but it's going to be hard. Sometimes love is saying no. Can I get an amen? amen? Kids are not adults. Their worldviews are developing. They're forming. And to, we have to give them some parameters. And those parameters can be, this is the circle in which, in which you kind of play in. But don't step out of the circle because there's danger on the outside. And that works as adults as well. Sometimes I have to tell myself, no, you can't have that right now or ever. But it's not to be mean or demeaning or to put off or, or, or to be nasty. It's just to know that parameters are necessary in order for us to grow in our love. Look out for the idols of your heart, for they will set ablaze the field. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Love is revealed in Christ, reflected through his people, and received through the Spirit. Therefore, go out and share the love of Christ in reflecting his kindness towards others. Pray with me, please. Father, I pray that you would energize, oh, sorry, energize our hearts, energize our lives. Lord, to experience you, to experience your love, and in experiencing that love, God, we would reflect it in our lives. Father, we cannot instruct our minds in love, although there are principles that govern and guide it. Lord, love is something that's seen. Love is something that's caught. Love is something that is experienced. So God, help us to experience your love. Help us to enhance that experience by reading the story of your love that you've given us. And Lord, as we see the radiant sunshine of your love, may we reflect that in our lives. 
Lord, communion is an appropriate time to think about these things, to ponder these things. How you broke, your body was broken, your blood was spilled because you love us and you gave yourself for us. Lord, we remember you this morning. This morning is communion, and we celebrate communion on a regular basis as a reminder of this amazing love that was shown to us through Christ. You don't have to be a member of New Life Bible Church to participate in communion. The Word of God teaches us that all those who have said, yes, I will follow Jesus, who realize who he is and what he has done and have committed their lives to that, the Word of God tells us that you are a follower of Christ, You've received his spirit, and communion is meaningful for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This time I'd like to invite you to join us in celebrating the body and blood of Jesus by receiving of the symbols of his sacrifice.
Come on, everybody, lift it up now.